Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so, uh, this is me, I'm an anaesthetist and intensivist at, uh, actually, we've probably changed our trust name from Northwest London to London Northwest. Uh, first October. Um, so, I forgot to update the slides. Um, so, um, obviously, a large number of faces. I brought along my handy uh, spotter's guide that I use at our uh, trust induction day. Uh, so, this is kind of how I see the world. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's a minute or something around there. Phoenix around the end there. Um, so uh, basically what we've got to cover is uh, A, why give fluids? Why are you giving fluids in the context of AKI? Um, how much should you give? When do you stop? Uh, and um, as mentioned, which uh, fluids do we give? Why are we giving fluids? We're trying to, often we're trying to prevent uh, impending AKI where we see the patient at risk and are trying to head things off at the past. We also give fluid, or people try and give fluid in order to stabilize and recover. Uh, and we need to ask whether that's actually the right thing to do. In other words, you've got a patient with uh, established renal failure and you're filling them to try and keep the kidneys going after an ITU, and that's quite a common concept, whether it's right, something we'll look at. Um, both of these are time and context sensitive, you've got to get a diagnosis right, uh, and if you're going to give things, you've got to give it at the right time, uh, as David's mentioned. And um, it's important to be aware your strategies and endpoints are going to differ according to the context and the timing. And a mistake that can be made is people think, okay, fluids, uh, kidneys, flushing out, you know, won't do any harm, I can only do good. Uh, may work or may not, but let's try anyway. Um, and certainly there have been eras and uh, places, uh, as I said, everyone remember, I'm going to encourage to Charing Cross <laughs> to you, where the answer to everything was just pile in more gel effusion. Um, <laughs> at all times, forever. Um, so, uh, we'll, <laughs> um, opt uh, I'll say that's the case now. Um, so, what are we trying to do? We're trying to optimize uh, LV preload. So, fluids are there for a very specific purpose, which is you're trying to optimize the stroke volume. Um, and by doing that, you're trying to optimize renal perfusion and blood flow. Um, and by doing that, you're trying to mitigate the pre-renal uh, element of AKI. So you're not giving it that random or just as a general sort of washout. You're trying to achieve a very specific thing. And therefore, it's only worth doing uh, and it's only the right thing to do if you're going to achieve that chain of events. And therefore, you have to look at every stage. There is a, a sort of smaller print element of diluting toxins, washing out, tubular sludge, but mainly it fluids are aimed at that renal perfusion element. So the questions to ask yourself are, are we actually doing that? We'll look at that in a little bit more detail later. Um, anecdotal evidence, if you like, leading towards it. Uh, so this is from the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Uh, during that time, the US military got better at the sort of scoop and run approach of getting people off the battlefield, getting them flu uh, uh, resuscitated, getting surgery in sooner. That progression has carried on with more recent conflicts. Um, but with that, the incidence of AKI uh, improved from um, 1 in 200 to 1 in 600 in, in sort of young fit people with casualties. Um, if you're more into the kind of primary basic science and rat bothering end of things, uh, you can have a rodent model where you can in, uh, insult the kidney with um, glycerol and you get drops in uh, renal blood flow and you can reverse those with uh, <coughs> injections of fluid. So there is reason to think that this mechanism works. Um, and there are a range of, obviously, uh, perioperative care has been received a lot of more recent attention, but in this review from early on 2009, uh, review of 20 studies, over 4,000 patients. Uh, at that stage, post-operative acute renal injury significantly reduced with um, optimizing the hemodynamics perioperatively. So it all seems to argue in favor of giving fluids. Um, is that always the right thing to do? Well, one of the things, the, the chain of events is if you give fluid, you may improve renal perfusion, you may mitigate egg care, but what you will do is make the patient more positive. Um, so you have a, a definite potential negative to set against your potential positives. Um, no pun intended. So uh, this is an observational study of septic patients, um, again about 3,000 patients, uh, of which 36% developed AKI. Uh, and this is all-cause mortality, but the more positive patients um, had a higher mortality. Now obviously there's a cause and effect issue with that, in that you may be dealing with sicker, leakier patients um, who then die. So it's not the fluid is necessarily causing um, high mortality, but it, it sounds a bit of an alarm bell. Um, in uh, more specific renal disease, 618 patients, again, multi-center observational study. Um, patients who were overloaded by the time they went on to um, renal support had a higher mortality. So this may be as much about timing as about the amount of fluid, and that's starting to get to the message that, uh, you know, when do you actually decide to give up trying to fill and get on to renal support early? Um, and there's been a trend in that towards much earlier uh, hemofiltration and so on than we used to do as well. Um, so, the fluid overload at time of dialysis correlates with higher mortality. Um, and also, um, it didn't correlate with renal recovery. So, it's not that there's a bit of myth busting, if you like, but it's not that the wetter you are when you're sick, then the more, the more likely your kidneys are to start working again. Uh, and if anything, the opposite, as we'll see. Um, a factorial analysis of a study that was aimed at lung injury, um, and, but within that, um, patients in the conservative fluid management arm, 
uh, where you expect them to do better perhaps from a lung point of view, you might necessarily expect them to do better from a kidney point of view. And actually the sort of raw creatinine rise is greater in the, in the fluid conservative arm. But when you adjust it for dilutional effects, you could argue that the AKI incidence is actually higher, you know, according to diagnostic criteria, in the more fluid liberal arm. And these people are getting quite a, quite a significant difference in fluid. Um, and it seemed to be that um, they were, if anything, more prone to getting uh, kidney injury in this sort of population of lung injured patients. Um, again, from a more renally focused study, um, patients who are managed with a, a more negative fluid balance day to day have a decreased mortality. So this may seem like mother of apple pie, uh, particularly coming at it from a renal background, but two intensivists who, tend, who suddenly had a culture of piling in fluids whenever the pressure dropped because we were terrified of drying out our patients, crisping them with um, vasoconstrictors, turning them black around the ages, as David said. So the cultures are much, you know, give a bit of fluid to be on the safe side, and if they end up thousands of mils positive after a week, then we'll just deal with that later. But actually, maybe that's the wrong approach. Um, and as we'll see, a lot of this comes down to which phase of the illness you're, uh, you're in. So it's not about whether you always run them dry or always run them wet. It's about having a sense of the timing and doing the right things at the right time. So, um, and as you can see here from the Kaplan-Meier, the difference in survival is actually quite significant. So where we're getting towards is really the idea that you have a just, just right amount of fluid. Um, so I came in during the coffee break and uh, Seren's uh, slide actually covered my entire talk on his second bullet point. <laughs> when you say that you're walking a fine line between hypovolemia and hypervolemia, uh, which is essentially what this is. Um, and the argument is, if you're, under, if you're underfilled, you will have a suboptimal preload, your ventricles won't work right, you will underperfuse yourself, including your uh, renal blood flow and therefore you get organ ischemia as well as obviously other organs. But equally, if you overfill, uh, you get organ edema. Uh, and that's not just about LVF and lungs, it's about every other tissue. You're getting tissue edema, your diffusion distances from capillary tissues are increasing. Encapsulated organs, uh, which actually includes the kidney, uh, will become compressed. This is from uh, John Prowell's uh, most recent, um, sorry, he's not on the faculty this year, is he? But uh, he's done a lot of stuff on, uh, uh, on fluids and uh, kidney disease. And um, this is quite a nice diagram which shows, I don't know if I've got a, I've got a pointer. I'll just gesticulate. Uh, so on the left there, you've got the macro view of the kidney. Um, so in a, in a very edematous, overfilled patient day to day, you may have filled them with good intentions at the beginning of their kidney disease, but if you allow them to carry on positive, thank you. Okay. So uh, uh, the macro view is you've got uh, increased abdominal pressure for a start, very edematous, uh, tense patients with a bloated abdomen. You get increased venous pressure, uh, increased renal vascular resistance, and so you're getting compressed um, renal tissue. Uh, at the sort of micro level, you're getting a reduced arterial filtration gradient, increased tubular pressures. Um, and overall, this is, you've got a, a squashed kidney inside a capsule, inside a squashed uh, bloated abdomen, at the same time as you're also compressing liver and everything else, and, and your general tissues have got an increased distance for oxygen nutrients to travel. So um, the sort of idea that the wetter you are, the better your kidneys will do, because it's somehow just one big tube, and if you keep it flush, it'll work all right, um, doesn't really work. Um, and intuitively, that takes a while to get in, and sort of my unit, I just have to kind of remind people. Uh, so we have an MDT now, um, and we've stopped bringing the charts out uh, because of cross-infection, but we now sit in a room like this, talk about the patients, the uh, residents and IT, our IT just put up the slides, uh, and because we're not looking at the charts, the fluid balances, unless you specifically say, make sure you put it on the slide, always gets overlooked, uh, and half my colleagues don't even ask. Um, so it's very easy for patients to get more and more positive, uh, particularly in an ITU setting, but also elsewhere. So although it seems obvious, when I put it like this, uh, people sort of forget it. Um, the, um, so, uh, an earlier paper by John and Co. Uh, with um, Prof. Belomo. Uh, this was looking, I think I'll skip over this, um, just showing us a little subgroup of uh, patients in the perioperative stage, showing that um, when you do gold direct therapy in the perioperative setting, uh, this group where you're fluid neutral are the only ones where you show a benefit from gold direct therapy in that particular context. But I think that's probably a bit too small for impact. Um, just on a more practical note, uh, I'll have to put this in, it was getting a bit long in the took now, 2006. Uh, this was us. Um, we have a phase one trial unit and uh, somebody unloaded a new monotrome antibody into uh, some healthy volunteers, at which point uh, they had massive TNF uh, and interleukin surge. Did a very good impression of being septic, although it was a molecular uh, disaster rather than an infectious one and pitched up on our unit uh, with some previously unknown to man disease, essentially. Um, and in the process, we filled them up with lots of fluid. Uh, this happened, uh, it's just an anecdote, uh, but this is what happens when you have a leaky patient, you give them lots of volume trying to resuscitate them in the first hour, 24 hours. One of the, uh, one of the guy's girlfriends went out in tears to uh, 
the BBC and said he looks like the elephant man because he's a massive sort of bloated uh, septic patient. I'm sure actually the scenario is familiar to you, even if this particular course of events isn't. Um, so uh, just a rather uh, florid example of what happens when you overfill. Um, they did okay. Uh, the other bit of the other learning point is if you're in one of these things and somebody says, can you be the front man for the media at a time when it's about to take over Saddam Hussein's trial as a big news story on CNN? Uh, just say no, otherwise this will just be the label as a 9-11 terrorist. So, reason for caution in fluid, uh, with fluids and AKI, uh, but does it actually work? Is it that you're achieving some benefit, but you have to be careful not to overdo things? Or are they, you know, are they actually effective? So let's just come back to this chain of events. You're trying to increase the LV pre, or optimize rather, not to increase, or not optimize uh, the preload uh, in order to optimize the stroke volume and cardiac output, as David's talked about. You're trying to optimize blood pressure, you're trying to improve renal blood flow and renal perfusion, and mitigate uh, the pre renal and fake AI. So, to make all that happen, you have to have a sort of chain of belief that each of those steps is happening and one leads to the other. Um, so, uh, this is quite a nice little conceptual uh, paper and talks about this in, in that aspect. So, what you're basically saying is you need to have a volume responsive patient. In other words, you give that patient fluid, their blood pressure comes up, they go pink around the edges, and they, as a, as a whole organism, respond to you. But secondly, their kidneys then have to respond to that. So, you could have a, a nicely filled pink patient, but their kidneys may already be beyond the pale in terms of, you know, somebody's loaded with ultra or whatever. So if you then carry on filling them, you'll turn them from a warm, pink, happy patient to a bloated, unhappy patient, and you haven't actually done anything for the kidneys. So you need to have all steps of that. Um, are, patient, are patients volume responsive? In most cases, yes. I mean, David's covered this aspect, but obviously clean not always. Um, and if a patient is filled, are they then volume responsive? In most cases, yes, if you catch them early, so timing is relevant. Uh, but also, there are obviously specific cases where there may not be, so intrinsic renal disease uh, and all these things. So if somebody has poisoned them with uh, monstroidal, it may not be the right uh, thing to give them. Um, and it may be too late. So the, uh, the Himmelfarm's model is this. So this is time, and essentially have a therapeutic window that narrows. So there are some patients that are never going to respond to volume. Uh, there are others that will, but as time passes and they get into established AKI, you may have missed that slot, and it will do harm by overfilling them. Um, and the trick is knowing when, uh, which is which. And there is, uh, you know, obviously one of the questions is, do you have biomarkers that will tell you? But generally, the earlier, the better. So the clinical context is, do you have volume responsive AKI needing primary resuscitation? So this is a shock patient that you can get back out of shock. Uh, it's time sensitive. You may have a volume responsive AKI patient who needs ongoing replacement. So a burns patient, somebody who remains septic, who's still bleeding to plug the hole. Uh, they're going to need you to keep filling them. So essentially, you're not making them positive, you're just keeping up with volume loss, but that may mean keeping up with intravascular losses, uh, even at the expense of, of an overall positive balance. So filling may well be the right thing to do, and continuing to fill may be the right thing to do, depending on the diagnosis. And then you have other people who are never going to respond. They're non-volume responsive. So some patients... I'm going to because it's a lot of random timing. Okay. Uh, with the uh, fancy animation, so just reading from the top. Um, some patients are going to have volume responsive hemodynamics, the whole organism responds to fluid, and have volume responsive kidneys. Some patients, as a, as a whole organism, are not volume responsive, their heart's not going to respond to you. Some will respond overall, but their kidneys won't. And importantly, some patients did have volume responsive kidneys, but you missed it because you started your ward round too late or you went home at five and didn't hand over. Um, and to then go back and try and fill them retrospectively may or may not be the right thing to do. And you won't necessarily know which of these you're dealing with un until later down the line. You can look at risk factors. These are kind of generic risk factors for AKI. Um, and of those, many of them will be theoretically responsive to volume. If you've got a hypovolemic patient, clearly, hypotensive for other reasons, septic, maybe a contrast medium. And uh, some of the other elements do also respond to volume, potentially. Um, <coughs> this is just lead into sepsis, although uh, handily we've talked about this already. But uh, So this is one uh, study of 1,700 uh, or more. Uh, critically ill patients uh, in, sorry, looking at 30,000 ICU admissions uh, as an observational study, but of those, AKI uh, occurred in 5.7%, which seems pretty low from a, a UK setting, but this is in a, a non-UK healthcare system where most patients go to critical care. You know, it's only us who are used to bringing only the sickest people into ITU. Uh, the rest of the world tends to admit what we regard as HG patients. So it's quite a low proportion of AKI, but, uh, but they have it. But within that, nearly half of them are due to sepsis, uh, which I just put in as a way to lead into using sepsis as an example. Um, we've talked about this already. Uh, this is the Detroit study. Uh, and as mentioned, in a way, this made quite a nice little uh, 
example of giving the right fluid at the right time, in that, as David mentioned, they have the same volume of fluid every 72 hours, but they receive more early on, and that arguably um, was part of this quite large significant difference in mortality. It did raise some eyebrows even at the time, because that mort control mortality, 46.5%, is quite high. Um, and the question is whether they're doing the wrong things in the control arm rather than uh, how well the, the, the treatment arm went. Um, and in a way that ties in uh, to the more recent findings. So this is a process study. So there are basically three big studies trying to replicate the, uh, the Detroit findings. This is a US one, uh, which looks at 1,300, 60-day mortality, and basically found no difference in mortality and no difference in uh, renal replacement duration. In other words, organ support um, using the same protocol of targeting uh, mixed venous saturation. This is the um, Australasian study, uh, primarily Australia and New Zealand, done by ANZICS, which we've already mentioned, or Davis mentioned, 1,600 patients, and again, uh, no difference in mortality or failure. There is a UK study uh, forthcoming, promise. Um, but overall, so although the, um, although the, the follow-up studies don't necessarily back up the message of Detroit, we quite like showing those that slide. Uh, because it gives that message across that you need to do the right thing at the right time. And it may be that the follow-up studies, they are a decade later, you know, the Detroit study was in 2001 when dinosaurs and John Prescott still roamed the earth. So we were doing things differently then. It may be we just got better at it, uh, but also maybe, as you said, that the, we're doing it better in the centres, but actually when you go to uh, the sort of shambles that is Norfolk Park, um, <laughs> what, what you see out on the wards may be more effective in 2000 uh, or 1999 or whatever than it, than it is at the Australian ITU now. So I think there is a valuable message. The message is basically this. Uh, you can make a, a happy pig into a sick pig. You can make a sick pig into a happy pig. You cannot make a pig out of sausages. Um, so if you leave it too late, um, it's not well. So whatever you're going to do, you should do it in a timely fashion. Don't necessarily do it too much, but do it in time. Um, how much fluid should you give? Well, again, what you're trying to achieve is you're trying to optimize cardiac kappa. There is no magic property of fluid that just by sort of ebbing up from beneath it is going to make you better in some magical way. All you're trying to do is improve the circulation. If you're not doing that, you should stop uh, and find another way to do it. So in all of these cases, um, if you get the preload right, you will get it. There is a starting curve. Obviously, in a failing heart, it may be uh, shallower. How do you know where you are with that? Um, uh, this is uh, discussed in the previous talk. Um, uh, in everything from judging preload through to measuring cardiac output through to getting some estimates of organ perfusion, whether it's uh, warm peripheries uh, or organ response, uh, and through to biochemical marks such as lactate. Um, three rules, uh, just to back up David's points really. Flow measures, uh, dynamic measures are better than static preload. Preload is useful, but can potentially be misleading. Um, a way of doing that is to look at the actual cardiac output response and, and do it dynamically. So to pick up on uh, David's item two, the, um, the young patient with the, um, uh, just from the blood, arguably if, uh, if the registrar stuck a Doppler down and just seen if he responded with stroke volume rise to fluid, uh, just as a trial dose, he might well have seen that he did. Uh, rather than being sort of misled by the, um, the, by the static pressures. So just as a, um, a sort of an example, if you like, in a shock patient, um, if you've got somebody with a lactate and it starts to reverse, then again, that's reassuring that you're doing the right thing. So I'm not going to go through this line by line, but what you're basically trying to do, uh, and I would argue for a, um, uh, as a, a dynamic response, is just have a quick and dirty method of measuring cardiac output or stroke volume. It might be as simple as a finger on the pulse, or an A&E, uh, uh, or a soft gel Doppler, or a PICO or LIBCO, PA catheter, whatever, uh, and just look at the response of the stroke volume to your bolus of fluid, because that should apply in theory uh, in all cases. So if you've got a normal responsive uh, ventricle, you put your um, bolus of fluid in, stroke volume goes up, and then you kind of repeat on rinse cycle until you uh, find that that starts to go away. So you put in your uh, X hundred mils, try and get a 10% increase in stroke volume. It actually almost doesn't matter how calibrated and how accurate your stroke volume measurement is. So on ITU, my, a lot of my colleagues have rejected having the sort of waveform analysis like the Lipco Express that we use in theatres, uh, because they say, well, nobody's calibrated against the PA catheter or whatever. But actually, as long as it's showing an accurate trend, you can do this. You can say, is it going up when I give fluid? And if it isn't, then there's no point in giving fluid. Uh, and you keep going until it shadows out. If you've got a failing ventricle, the same applies. You just have to watch more carefully. Um, obviously, you may have it wrong. Uh, and obviously, if you go in here and then load up a couple of litres trying to get the response, then you may tip over. So your starting point may be not where you expect, so it's not an argument for randomly giving lots of fluid, but it's worth trying. 
Um, so what is the correct approach? Be guided by the initial diagnosis, but not restricted by. So if the orthopedic department has kind of simply somebody with uh, the entire stock of Voltrol in their circulation, you may you may not, that doesn't stop you giving fluid to try and correct things, but it may just put up a bit of a red light that fitting them to death may not work because they may already pass through that to a particular veil. Um, treat all patients as potentially volume responsive, uh, especially if hypotensive, but not necessarily only then. Give titrated volume challenges and be clear about what you're trying to do, uh, which is optimize the stroke volume. And uh, sick pigs and sausages, do it early. Uh, and know when to stop. Um, so this is a basic approach. Give a bonus. Does the stroke volume change by any measure you have, uh, whether it's conscious level or pulse or anything else? Um, uh, are you moving towards your goals? If, you're, if you improve the stroke volume, but you're still not achieving what you think you're going to achieve, then stop and rethink. Um, and certainly, you know, John Prowl would argue for you know being fairly prompt with starting days of constrictors and getting on to renal support early. Uh, considering direct cardiac output, direct cardiac output monitoring, tissue perfusion measures, whether hands on fingers, uh, hands on toes, whatever, peripheral perfusion, or, or biochemical markers to lactate and end organ function. Um, as an informal prediction, I'd say we'd probably like to see more of these. So we've seen this more and more in theatres now, where you just put in your arterial line and you just walk up to the back of the machine, plug in your wa waveform analysis, you forget about any form of lithium or thermodilution calibration, you simply put the waveform, it's just basically just a software module that goes on your existing arm. Um, uh, in terms of this still kind of, uh, which I am one, but my intensivist colleagues are still a bit up themselves about <laughs> using this in ITU, but we're spreading them around in theatres uh, quite happily, and there's no reason why this can't be done in medical HDU or just on the wards, or in mobile anyway, so you have an arterial line at least. Um, so trend analysis, just looking at straight volume. So this could be the future where everybody has some cardiac output running all the time, and this is how you optimize your perioperative care. Uh, which flus do you give? Um, so uh, as you kind of mentioned, this, um, this is a case in point. So why do we give colloid? What's the rationale? The rationale is you, give, you have a higher oncotic pressure, therefore less resuscitation volume. The thinking is you give, you know, you give half a litre of gelifusin and three litres of uh, dextrose or whatever based on volumes of distribution. Um, more rapid attainment of circulatory goals, which may still be valid, and that it's more persistent in the circulation. So that's the idea. Uh, that you're not having to give lots of fluid and keep giving basically water. It just gives some nice, uh, nice jelly-like stuff instead. Um, does that work? Well, what it doesn't allow for um, is capillary pressure. So a hypotensive, under-diffused patient in whom you give uh, any fluid may hold, hold on to it better than somebody who's overfilled and you then put in some gel diffusion and it leaks out anyway because their capillary pressure is so high. So there's various factors uh, that don't quite fit into this model. Does it work overall? Uh, back in 2000, um, uh, no, basically is the answer. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the systematic review from early on looking at uh, multiplicity of trials, Albin versus crystalloid, uh, starch versus crystalloid, gelatin, dextrans, uh, pooled relative risk basically showed no benefit from colloids. Um, this was a, uh, a two by two study which looked at insulin therapy but also synthetic colloid uh, versus uh, quite a high sort of kilo Dalton H200. Um, versus Hartman's, and they found a higher rate of acute kidney injury in the, in the starch group, um, and a higher rate of renal support, higher duration of renal support. Um, and uh, interestingly, the reason I put this, I mean, there's also studies looking at this, but the reason I put this out is the ratio they found of Hartman's to um, starch is only 1.32. So this idea that by giving um, starch, you're saving yourself giving bags and bags of fluid. Uh, doesn't really work. You're only giving 1.32 times as much esteroid as you are of, of, um, of HES, which raises some interesting questions there as well. So the rationale starts to go away as well. Um, there are a couple of follow-up big studies, just as we've had some recent ones about um, the sepsis approach. A couple of big studies a couple of years ago. It's a Scandinavian study in ITU, septic patients looking at um, a lower, uh, smaller molecular uh, starch. So one of the arguments was that if you have... Um, Start with a 200 kilo Dalton size, that that's somehow bad for you, causes inflammation, plugs up your membranes or whatever. Uh, but the people that sold the 130 uh, HESPAN will come around assiduously showing you that that's never been proven in our product. And so 130.42 uh, uh, starch is fine. So these two studies looked at that and found that again, higher mortality, higher rate of renal replacement therapy, uh, and actually coagulopathic effects as well. So there seemed to be some inflammatory process going on uh, and effects on coagulopathy. That was um, essentially replicated here in the chest study, a uh, larger group of patients, North American, I think, um, and they also showed a higher rate of adverse events with pleuritis and rash. Again, as you might expect with these more complex molecules. So we've gone off starches, um, and um, there's relatively little reason to use them, I would argue. Uh, the story got complicated by this man. Anyone know who this is? 
This is uh, Joachim Bolt, a um, professor in Germany, who was a very prolific author, published about 100 papers. At one rate, he was, at one point, he was submitting them once a month. The slight problem was he was making it up. Uh, so only 10 out of the studies were, had some fraudulent data in. Um, so uh, this is not what you want to have on your mother's fridge, um, about uh, what her proud son's been up to. Um, so uh, basically he was uh, picked up uh, by an assiduous uh, reader from another journal. He published everywhere, there were very big studies in big papers, in big journals. Uh, somebody in North America picked up that he had very narrow standard deviations in his groups with a suspiciously wide uh, gap between them uh, and very sort of marked effect in very small numbers of patients didn't quite look right. Um, so he had to retract many of his papers. Uh, so don't do this, uh, people will shout at you and you'll be drummed out of the Boy Scouts. Um, so he's been sent off uh, to the gulag, essentially. Um, but one of the things is, if you are going to commit fraud, uh, in order to uh, minimize the damage to humanity, try not to publish a whole series of papers in the same fields, because what you do is you completely screw up somebody else's meta-analysis, um, which is essentially what he did. So this is a paper that came out after, in an attempt to correct things, uh, in 2013. This all happened in 2011. Um, and they looked at all the available studies around, and this is relevant to this discussion because it was made, a lot of his stuff was on starch versus crystalloids, and his were largely favorable to starches. Not that he was working for drug companies, it's just that he published a series of papers and one suspects he got a bit over-enthusiastic about keeping up his output, and he started to confabulate based on things he probably had found genuinely earlier, um, but if you were doing them for real, you might well have found, started to find opposing results. So out of this sort of string of uh, papers in that particular field, uh, so if you did a proper um, systematic review, uh, he accounted for this lot, and as you can see overall, that's slightly to the left of that curve, so more favoring starches. If you took that out, um, so looking at 10,880 patients uh, of published studies, the relative risk um, with his papers in, um, was 1.07, which overlaps with unity, so you could say that there's no, no proof of uh, harm from colloids. If you took his papers out, and these were papers that he hadn't, I think still hasn't retracted, but they just have his name on. If you take them out, uh, you get a more convincing spread that shows that colloids seem to be more harmful. Um, so the sort of stories you read in the papers have become relevant to this particular topic. Uh, and out of these, uh, more convincing um, evidence of renal failure and uh, support. Some bright spark has been asked why that number is higher than that one, uh, and I'm not going to answer that because I meant to look it up, and uh, I haven't quite figured it out. <laughs> but, um, so starches are unconvincing um, at the moment. Um, there may well be, the, the rationale of giving a small amount of fluid early and having a sustained effect may well work in an, an operative setting uh, where you're not worrying too much about leaky uh, capillaries. So if somebody presents me with a hemorrhaging aneurysm and the nearest thing I've got is a bag of diffusion, I'll happily stick that in rather than of crystalloid, but uh, in a sort of generic um, sepsis, stroke ITU setting, um, not so much. Chloride, uh, hyper, so we, what do you do when you're not giving your starch? Um, one thing I haven't mentioned is gelifusin and albumin. Uh, basically, the evidence for gelifusin being harmful is uh, equivocal, um, but it costs uh, X times more than crystalloid. Albumin does seem quite safe. I haven't mentioned the safe study up here. Uh, but that's usable. Uh, I tend to use it in high concentrations as well, but I reason people to try and get, their, get them dry out at the end of their illness. But as a resuscitation fluid, it's no, probably no better or no worse, uh, but it's again more expensive. So I haven't put slides on those up here. Uh, the, the, the colloids have been where the, um, sorry, the starches have been, a lot where all the research interest has been. So you're going to give crystalloids. Which ones are you going to give? Traditionally, we just pile in some uh, uh, saline, 0.9%. The trouble with that is it's one to one sodium chloride, as you'd expect from the name. Uh, it's got 154 millimoles of sodium and therefore 154 millimoles of chloride. Your plasma is 100, 100 to 105, isn't it? So, um, so you're giving hyperchloremic um, solution as your crystalloid replacement, and you're giving it with enthusiasm uh, because you've ruled out all your other agents. You've said gelifusin and albumin are too expensive. You're not going to give starches, so let's just give them lots of saline. And this is what tends to happen on the wards, but you are making them hyperchloremic. Hyperchloremia makes you acid acidotic. It drops your renal blood flow. It decreases sodium excretion. If you take nine healthy male volunteers, uh, after our experience with the drug thing, if somebody says healthy male volunteers to me, I tend to twitch nervously, but this is, um, <laughs> there is a reward for them. Uh, if you take healthy male volunteers and you uh, do a crossover study where you put two litres of either saline or Hartman's into them over a two-hour period, and then you cross them over and give the same people the other, the other stuff uh, later, uh, you can fairly convincingly show, uh, you look at their body weight, hematopexia and biochemistry, they all developed a sustained hyperchloremia that lasts for over the six hours. So you pushed up their chloride levels just by giving them two litres of saline in a healthy patient. Um, and you drop the bicarbonate and they become acidotic. 
Um, they also retain uh, that saline more, uh, whereas when you give them Hartman's, they pee more, pee more of it out. So their time to mix they didn't catheterize them, but their time to mix uh was lower with Hartman's, and they're looking at body weight, they shed more fluid uh, out again. And these are healthy people that didn't necessarily need that fluid, so they're more appropriately diuresing with the Hartman's than they are with saline. Um, in, uh, this is a study looking at a large proportion, 20% of all US discharges uh, of people who had open abdominal surgery. So this is using their claims database, um, not, not really for legal claims, it's the billing claims, I think. So this is a large number of patients, obviously retrospective and just looking at notes. But 30,000 uh, patients received normal saline, 1,000 received balanced crystalloid, in other words, low chloride or normal chloride crystalloid. Um, so extreme samples, unequal groups, uh, also all fairly dodgy, but for what it's worth, uh, it favoured the balanced crystalloid, looking at overall complication rates, uh, mortality, uh, GI, renal, cardiac, respiratory, hemorrhage and infection rates. So that it may be that giving saline to people isn't the best thing to do. Um, that's been uh, looked at in an ITU setting, um, again, open, not a randomised perspective control trial, but open label sequential pilot study. Um, I may have missed some follow-up to this actually, but uh, liberal use of chloride-rich fluids versus balanced crystalloid, such as Hartman's or Plasmalite, um, gives you a lower incidence of AKI and a lower rate of renal replacement. So, um, flung up lots of uh, random slides at you, but it comes back to the same message. In acute illness, intervene early, whatever you're gonna do. That means diagnostically treating the sepsis, giving the antibiotic, take them to the edge to sort out the hole, but also specifically with kidneys, uh, sort out the primary diagnosis, but if you're going to give volume, uh, do it early. Give incremental guided volume challenges to achieve adequate stroke volume. Uh, as David said, the static measures of right atrial pressure can be very useful. They will often give you the right answer. They can sometimes mislead. If you combine that with also then looking at the stroke volume response, which you can do intuitively just by seeing if the pulse gets faster. Uh, as you give the volume by the side of the bed. It doesn't have to be sophisticated technology. Um, that'll give you a more dynamic picture. Uh, use balanced crystalloid uh, to get plasma light, Hartman's rather than saline. Avoid starch, be careful about chloride. Uh, have a low threshold for vasoconstrictors and renal replacement therapy. So we haven't talked about when do you stop giving fluid. We've indicated that when you think you're not doing any further good in terms of stroke volume, you should stop there. But in terms of disease process, um, you need to sort of think about, okay, I'm treating them right now because they're septic, but am I going to be doing this tomorrow? Um, and rather than that, let the interpretation just keep filling them for the next few days, you need to think actually, do we now start to dry, start drying them out because the sepsis has gone away a bit? So be aggressive about drying them out when necessary. People do better when it's neutral or negative. And if they're getting edematous and putting on weight, then they probably are getting less um, physiologically healthy or increasing the distance for their oxygen to uh, diffuse and nothing else. Um, this is a bit poignant in the view of the uh, bolt thing, but I quite like it. Um, so, uh, yes.